May 1994, ethnic strife rips the former Yugoslavia apart in a modern European holocaust. Bloodletting not seen since World War II revisits the continent. 800 such days have preceded this, and the world has taken little heed of the carnage. But when an artillery shell explodes in Sarajevo's central marketplace, a British news crew captures the images that force Western powers to take notice. NATO leaders convene and confer, but take no real action. With the flow of new victims come rumors of a new horror. There is talk of concentration camps, mutilation and mass murder. The vocabulary of genocide mingles with the cries of the wounded. In Yugoslavia, even government leaders are in denial of the emerging Holocaust. 50% of alleged camps that I have visited, and I have not found concentration camp. Images of a devastated society bombard the West, and over time, compel American President Bill Clinton to act. There are still times when America and America alone can and should make the difference for peace. Soon, a 40-year-old creation of the Cold War will take to the skies over Bosnia. And you see planes flying over and they monitor genocide. Today, they took a picture of those killings. They saw everything. All right, coming down. Launching from an airstrip in southern France, American U-2 pilots will keep a constant vigil over the warring factions below. Fifteen miles above the killing fields of the former Yugoslavia, the Lockheed Utility 2 carries out a mission little changed since it first confirmed the existence of Soviet missiles in Cuba over 35 years ago. Instead of missiles, pilots search for photographic evidence of ethnic cleansing. Flying toward the edge of space, the U-2 is a bird of peace. But this, like most reconnaissance operations, is anything but peaceful. Since 1950, over 100 spy plane pilots have lost their lives flying secret missions over foreign lands. There's an old saying that reconnaissance flies alone, unarmed, unafraid, and unheralded. And that's true. And people don't realize how really how brave these men are. They put their lives on the line every time they fly one of these missions. Uh, not only from defenses, but also from uh, the possibility of an engine failure. we may never know the names or exact number of men lost. The U-2 is notoriously difficult to operate. Pilots call her the Dragon Lady. It is for good reason. The U-2 functions in what aviators describe as the coffin corner, a 10-knot window where if they fly any slower, the aircraft will stall and any faster, and the plane will rip itself apart. At 70,000 feet, oxygen is so scarce that the jet engine's flame often goes out in mid-flight. The plane is subsonic, no faster than most commercial airliners. An engine flame-out threatens the best defense it has, extreme altitude. 15 miles above the Earth, the air is much too thin to breathe. Atmospheric pressure is nearly non-existent. 
The U-2 pilot functions at an altitude where a sudden loss of cabin pressure would cause him to black out in three seconds, and all of his bodily fluids to boil off in about six. Because of this, he wears the same flight gear as NASA astronauts. Straining to control the plane in the thickly layered suit causes pilots to sweat out up to 10 pounds every mission. Many who wash out of the U-2 program do so because they cannot handle the claustrophobic nature of the flight gear. Your vision is, is somewhat restricted, obviously. You can look pretty much over your right shoulder and left shoulder. You're a little bit removed from everyone else. You're now in kind of your own atmosphere, if you will, in your own little environment in there. And you hear the valves of the pressure suit as you breathe. They work alone in radio silence, flying for up to nine hours in racetrack patterns above the Yugoslav republics. Along the way, they will gather over 2,000 photographic images of target areas pre-programmed into the plane's flight and optical computers. The serenity felt sailing through this cloudless frontier belies the tragedy playing out on the killing fields below. It is perhaps the ultimate solitude. The men in the cockpit call it the breakaway phenomenon. Flying at altitude is very, uh, it's very peaceful. Nighttime tends to be very impressive for me because you have so much less atmosphere. The sky uh, appears to be much brighter and there's uh, a definite perception that you don't get from Earth. Moon rises below me and falling stars that burn up below you. And very rarely do we have clouds to deal with at altitude, so typically your, your view is uh, quite spectacular. The U-2 was the first aircraft designed specifically for America's spy agency, the CIA. Even today, the plane is veiled in secrecy, and many details of Cold War missions remain classified to the year 2010. Using tools no more sophisticated than the slide rule, the legendary Kelly Johnson and his team at Lockheed Skunk Works brought the plane from a pencil sketch to test vehicle in just eight months. When it first flew in 1955, this aluminum machine weighed just 17,000 pounds. Today's U-2, stuffed with some of the most expensive black boxes money can buy, weighs more than twice that. America's spy planes are some of the nation's most closely held secrets. Many of these boxes, and the men who operate them, remain shrouded from public view. Unfortunately, this hasn't always been the case. In 1960, U-2 pilot Francis Gary Powers was downed by Soviet missiles over Russia. During the Soviet media circus that followed, some in the intelligence community denounced Powers for not having used the suicide needle supplied him. Today's pilots still live in a black world. Whether or not the American spy planes can now evade an enemy missile is something even a retired officer will not. Neither confirm yeah, nor deny. That you can, you, you actually get a warning in the, in the cockpit. Um, if you're being I can't talk much about that. Uh, I can say, well, I, I can say that w we knew that we were being tracked. I can say that, but I can't really talk anything about the systems. And... Within minutes of landing, the ground sensor crew removes the 105 millimeter camera from the aircraft's camera bay. As always, timing is critical. Fluid teamwork ensures that the 2,000 photographs taken on this mission will be processed and printed in less than 90 minutes. If rumors are true, somewhere amidst the 10,000 feet of film lies evidence of a human tragedy more detestable than war itself.
It is one of the oldest tools in the aerial reconnaissance craft. Even in today's world of spy satellites and radar imaging, the photograph retains a favored status in the intelligence community. No method is more cost effective or as reliable. Perhaps it is because the camera sees as the human eye does. Perhaps it is because a picture is still worth a thousand words. At the photo interpreter's light stand, the first undeniable signs of genocide appear. A single U-2 print typically covers a region of about eight square miles. To the untrained eye, these wide area views may seem innocuous enough. But the tools and techniques used at the CIA's National Photographic Interpretation Center leave little room for doubt. Able to magnify images 250 times, CIA photo interpreters are really highly skilled detectives. Detectives who combine what they see on the light stand with what they hear from operatives and eyewitnesses in Bosnia to create a complete intelligence picture. We in America have developed the analyst as the center of central intelligence to look at all the information, not just the secret information, but everything, and then put it together and tell us what it means. By midsummer of 1995, U.S. officials are armed with the photographic evidence they need to publicly expose Serbian war crimes. On August 9th, CIA Deputy Director John Gannon testifies before Congress. What you're moving to now, Mr. Gannon, has been obtained uh, in what way? Uh, this is aerial photography, you too. What intelligence has done, sir, is we have, at the end of this, been able to show you Quite apart from the human suffering, we have been able to show you a pattern that we can say with confidence that this pattern of abuse took place in over 3,000 villages of, of Bosnia. The presence of ground scarring and dump trucks corroborates the stories of mass graves told to reporters and relief workers by the survivors. When investigators are sent to examine the freshly moved earth, they find thousands of shallow graves where members of the Serbian National Army hastily buried their Muslim victims. Soon, 12,000 additional UN troops will be sent to stop the bloodshed. In the skies above Bosnia, an aging Cold Warrior helped bring an end to a post-Cold War genocide. Aerial photographs like those that documented mass murder in Bosnia were critical in efforts to stop the killing. In today's aerial intelligence game, however, photographs alone often no longer suffice. You have first your standard photo. Okay, that's a black and white photograph. Now, the black and white photograph is good, but it doesn't penetrate foliage. Radar will penetrate foliage, and you can see what's going on on the ground. For example, if a truck or tank is under the foliage, the radar will pick it up. Now, then you add infrared, you can see the tank, but the infrared will indicate that the tank is hot, that the engine is on. The U-2 has adapted well to modern times and is no longer restricted to photographic intelligence gathering alone. Some aircraft carry a special antenna that the pilots call C-SPAN-3. With it, photographic and radar images can bounce up to space and, via orbiting satellite, relay straight down to ground stations like this one in the California desert. When combined with cutting-edge radar imaging technology, these systems provide real-time intelligence. 
the ability to gather data over distant battlefields and within seconds convey it thousands of miles to political and military leaders at home. We're all used to being watched. All kinds of military and intelligence people are just perfectly used to the idea that uh, the other guys are photographing us from space. And, uh, you know, whether you like it or not, that's how we operate. In a world blanketed by spy satellites, some thought that the need for spy planes would diminish. But as the demand for real-time intelligence has increased, so has the need for flexibility. And flexibility is the one thing that billion-dollar satellites just do not have. You do have some ability to hide certain toys you might be playing with. You can't make your whole uh, nerve gas factory disappear because it's a huge immovable object, but you might be able to make some trucks go away or whatever it is, or you could put aircraft in hangars. A sophisticated foe can predict the arrival time of the satellite by tracking it on radar so they can evade certain types of detection. Now, if a fast airplane comes blasting across way up in the sky on a flight path that they had no way to anticipate at a time that was, of course, not announced in any way, it, it's like, oh, they took our picture. Damn, it happened, you know? Because the Dragon Lady is so difficult to fly, you two drivers depend on the eyes of a second pilot called a mobile who follows behind them in a Z-28 Camaro. What we normally do is just slip in behind and just kind of sheepdog along behind the plane, make sure that he's not gonna get himself into any problems with his taxi. Because the wingspan is so large, we need to keep a, a safety observer following the plane whenever it taxis around. It's very hard from the cockpit to see exactly where your wingtips and your uh, outrigger wheels are. On some configurations, you can't see the outrigger wheels at all. This truck over here is the pogo vehicle. It's the crew that's gonna go out on the runway and recover those outrigger wheels when they fall away during the takeoff sequence. Takeoff normally offset a little bit from the center line so that the crown of the runway doesn't make the bogles fall out too early. And on a lightweight aircraft like he's got, he'll be airborne by here easily. Pogo crew's coming out and removing the pogo pins, which releases small little teeth up in the wings that hold those things in. So they're able to free fall away now as soon as the wings start to flex up and create lift. Meanwhile, I'll take a look around the outside of the plane, look for obvious leaks, incorrect configurations, make sure the lights are working right, trim is set. Clear for takeoff. Gonna run the power up to 80%. Check the engine instruments, release the brakes. With a massive 103 foot wingspan, the U 2 is more giant glider than jet. Upon takeoff, it rises like a feather on a thermal wind. Landing is another story. From altitude, it takes the pilot over half an hour to coax the plane to Earth. As he nears touchdown, the pilot uses pumps to redistribute the fuel left in his wing tanks so that they are balanced during landing. All our pilots pull double duty, by the way. Uh, all U-2 pilots are qualified as mobile officers. We usually uh, will do about as many mobiles as flights. It's almost a one for one. Mobile copies. All right, he said he's going to touch and go on this one, so his fuel must be down low enough. The landings are, are very unique. Uh, there really isn't any instrumentation or anything that helps you land it. The little voice in your ear from the mobile gives you a good feeling for where the runway is, but the rest you kind of just have to uh, get really zen with. And it's all out the window and very heavy stick and rudder 
kind of inputs required to get the plane onto the runway because it's very heavy to fly down low at slow air speeds. The visibility from the cockpit is not good left and right. Uh, you don't have very much peripheral vision. That's what gives you your sense of sync. So that little voice from the mobile helps quite a bit also. It's very fun driving the car. It's a little hard to get used to uh, running down the runway at an aircraft that's getting ready to land, though. It's inherently unnatural. Four, three, two, 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 one, one, one. It's a very challenging plane to land because it's uh, obviously got that bicycle kind of configuration on the landing gear. So you've got to always land at tailwheel first and you have to continually balance the wings because those outrigger wheels aren't there after it takes off. A sudden crosswind can tip the U-2 off center. Even the most experienced flyers rely on reinforced skids on the wingtips. They fly alone and carry no weapons. Instead, recon pilots depend on three crucial means of survival, surprise, altitude, and sheer speed, something the U-2 has never had. Over 35 years ago, Gary Powers was knocked from the sky by a Soviet missile traveling twice the speed of sound. It was at that moment the CIA began their quest to fulfill this need for speed. Soon, American designers launched their newest black project, one that would create an aircraft able to fly faster and higher than any Soviet missile technician could ever dream. The SR-71 Blackbird. This spy plane would be part aircraft and part spaceship, a machine that would travel over three times the speed of sound and reach altitudes greater than 90,000 feet. In late 1961, the CIA turned to a proven group of men to transform this dream into reality. Soon, Kelly Johnson and his Lockheed's Skunk Works team are again hard at work. In a pre-computer age, they create an aeronautical marvel three generations ahead of its time. I'm a little bit surprised that Kelly Johnson even had the audacity to attempt anything as difficult as this uh, when the likelihood of failure is so great. I remember on our early airplane, while we were having so much trouble, I asked him one time, I said, if we're able to get 1,200 miles out of this thing, nautical miles, well, you deem it successful. And uh, he says, yeah, I'll think that's very successful. And hell, we got twice that. What they got was the fastest aircraft ever built. Pratt and Whitney J-58 engines, big enough to power the Queen Mary, launch its 140,000-pound body to the edge of space. The bullet from a high-powered rifle leaves the barrel at about 3,000 feet per second. On a routine mission, the Blackbird travels faster, 3,200 feet per second for up to 90 minutes at a time. No matter how serene it may look, this kind of speed requires unyielding precision. You know, Mach 3, boom. The turn radius is something like 100 miles, and they have all these critical fuel problems and, and other stuff. And so it's not a very spontaneous experience. These are carefully planned, choreographed missions. With the thunderous clap of a sonic boom, the Blackbird hurtles through the frigid atmosphere, leaving a fiery tail of shock diamonds in its wake. At 2,200 miles per hour, the aircraft becomes superheated from the friction created as the air rushes.
rushes by. And indicating Mach 3.0 at this time. When you go Mach 3, the amount of heat that the whole airframe, everything experiences all this heat, and nothing that they have at the store works. You know, there's no paint, no rubber, nothing. You know, metals, plastics, all, all this stuff is useless. And they just had to go through so many contortions to, to make every single part of the plane tolerant of these extreme temperatures. Temperature affects everything on this airplane. The average person probably is not cognizant of that fact, but the faster you go, the harder things get. The Lockheed jet is nine-tenths titanium, and when they build it, the CIA uses a phantom company to buy the material from the world's largest supplier, the Soviet Union. In flight, the titanium skin reaches 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit, causing it to expand by more than half a foot. This heat-induced expansion posed a real challenge to the Skunk Works team. When in design, they found that the aircraft was heated and then cooled, then the titanium skin would buckle and not return to shape. And they found by longitudinally corrugating the wing and fuselage parts of the aircraft, then the aircraft would go through the heating cycle, cool back down, and return to shape. One of the puzzles of extreme heat was never really solved. Sealants for the fuel tanks, they never came up with a polymer that would seal the joints in the skin panels that hold the fuel in, so the blackbirds sit on the ground and weep. That seems silly. You can look, oh, these stupid guys back in the 60s didn't know what they were doing. There's still no plastic, you know, that can get to 700F and not turn into uh, burnt hot dog oxide. Once at altitude, the heated skin stretches, sealing the aircraft's fuel cells. But as hot as the Blackbird gets, its heat signature remains low. Built to avoid the passive sweep of Soviet radar, the aircraft, larger than a Boeing 737, was a milestone in early stealth design. The inward canted tails, the chines that go along the sides, and the materials in the leading edges, there's uh, asbestos and some composites tucked in wedge-shaped sawtooth patterns into some of these surfaces. And the idea of that is to gobble up radar and not reflect it back. I've been told that the Blackbird has a problem on its belly. It's got a belly that has kind of like a boat hull, and that during a shallow turn, it may send a great big reflection down at some radar. But it's got a lot smaller radar cross-section than it would have if they hadn't taken precautions to invest in some early stealth work. In its 30 years of service, only 150 aviators have qualified to fly the SR. It is an elite fraternity. Prior to every Blackbird mission, 36 hours are devoted to prepare men and machine for flight. One of the most valued traits is maturity. Lieutenant Colonel Mike Finan is 43. All who enter the program must meet one fundamental requirement. They must be married. Most importantly, they must be physically fit. Mach 3 flight challenges both mind and body. At altitude, even a simple toothache can lead to blackouts. The job of preparing the pilots falls to men like Sergeant Lee LeBriar. This is the uh, S-1031C full pressure suit. What it does, it gives the pilot his own environment to survive in in case of an ejection or a rapid decompression at altitude. With the SR flying around 80,000 feet, um, at that altitude, if he were exposed to the environment, all the fluids in his body would evaporate and he wouldn't last more than a probably about five seconds. So what we do is we give him the suit and what it does, it keeps him in his own sealed, safe environment. The helmet itself is one size for all the crew members. What we do is we vary the thickness of the helmet liner itself. It has the earphones in it for communication. 
Of course, his microphone, which he can adjust from the outside of the helmet. This is called the face seal. As he cranks his handle here, it pulls the face seal against his face while pushing the helmet liner itself against the back of his head. And what it does, it actually seals around his entire face, and the whole front of the helmet is oxygenated. Every time he inhales, the regulator senses that and pumps oxygen in through these holes, which serve a dual purpose. What they do is they spray air across the visor, which of course has to be down to provide the seal for the suit itself. So it prevents the visor from fogging, and he's only given oxygen as he needs it. So when he exhales, the regulator stops pumping oxygen into the helmet. Lean forward, sir. Men preparing for high altitude flight must breathe pure oxygen for at least one hour before launch to remove all the nitrogen from their blood. This reduces the possibility of the bends. When you put a person in the airplane, the cost and weight and complexity goes up hugely because along with a person, you have all this life support stuff. You, you, you Maybe you're pressurizing the thing. You've got ejection seats. You've got all these instruments and controls and all kinds of stuff that's geared to the person, not to the airplane. The two-man crew is essential to success. Soon, pilot and reconnaissance systems officer, or RSO, will be traveling faster than a speeding bullet while operating some of the most sophisticated intelligence apparatus ever built. They are, in effect, the Blackbird's central nervous system. Two brains, two pairs of eyes, two sets of hands. Without them, this mass of metal and electronics could not function. Something that's, that's different about flying the SR-71 is the absolute and total man-machine integration. People talk about strapping an airplane on, but I don't believe you strapped an airplane on until you snapped your spurs uh, in, into the ejection seat and you hooked up your life support hoses and you've been given that responsibility. Before flight, each of the SR's huge power plants requires a jump start from two 454 cubic inch Chevy engines. The wine is deafening, and the steaming tarmac reeks of JP-7 seeping from the plane's unsealed fuel tanks. So much fuel is lost prior to launch that the Blackbird takes off with nearly dry tanks. The SR must join with a waiting tanker just minutes into flight. Slowing this trisonic jet to match the tanker's subsonic speed is anything but easy. It is a very difficult task for the pilots. That is one of the things that washed people out of the program more than any other part of the, um, um, of the regime. The navigator, the RSO, basically uh, found the tanker, got us up behind, and then the pilot was responsible for plugging us in and taking on the fuel. The other thing is that the tanker is very heavy, and um, at the beginning of the track, the SR is very light. So the SR it has to slow down because the tanker can only go so fast. So you're fairly close to stall speed in the SR as you hook up. As I said, one of the few things that washed people out of that program was the inability to stay in behind that tanker. As the fuel is transferred into the SR and the tanker begins to accelerate, that helps. But because you keep getting heavier, you stay fairly close to the stall speed all the way to the end. You always breathe a sigh of relief when you uh, feel the uh, boom kick you off and you know that you're full and you can go again. 15 minutes and 80,000 pounds of fuel later, the Blackbird is ready to retrieve images from halfway around the Earth. The 
Blackbird's global reach was first tested in the war-torn skies of the Middle East. Here, high above the banks of the Suez Canal, the prying eyes of the SR-71 helped ease tensions and keep a regional conflict from widening into global war. October 6, 1973. The Egyptian army smashes into Israeli troops along the Sinai. The attack is sudden, ferocious, and well executed. The Israelis are caught woefully unprepared by the assault. To the northeast, Syrian planes slash through Israel's border above the Golan Heights. The Arabs are intent on reclaiming land lost to the Israelis in 1967. Obviously, the outbreak of the war by the Egyptians and Syrians was a surprise, and it should not have been. It was the result of a very clever deception that uh, President Sadat had uh, run. He had run his troops up to the canal, sort of regularly every month, saying that this was a reinforcement of the canal and just an exercise as how to do it. So when it happened the tenth time, why, it really didn't evoke that much interest. Our intelligence, everybody's intelligence, failed to see through this plan of Sadat's. The Israelis rely on a people's army. It will take nearly two days to mobilize them. 12-foot-high sand berms defending Israeli positions along the canal were supposed to buy them the time to do this. The Egyptians have an ingenious but simple counter. Using high-pressure water hoses, they break through Israeli defenses in just hours. Soon, they move nearly 80,000 men and 200 tanks across the canal. Nothing but open desert and a small Israeli force lies between the Egyptians and Tel Aviv. The Egyptian and, and the Israeli armies were almost eyeball to eyeball. And one of the things that we spotted was Scud missiles. And at the same time, we saw that the Israelis uh, were pulling some of their Jericho missiles out of their igloos. So, so now, the escalation was that you could go nuclear. As the Israelis threaten nuclear escalation, both Americans and Soviets seek to lower the flame on what is soon called the October War. Just days before the assault, Soviet Premier Brezhnev had secretly launched a satellite to monitor events and aid his Egyptian allies. In response, President Richard Nixon soon orders American SR-71s to prepare for missions of their own. And in that situation, we wanted to know exactly where the Egyptian forces were and where the Israeli forces were, because Mr. Brezhnev had written a message to President Nixon saying, look, you've got to stop the Israeli. Uh, we should go in together, Russians and Americans. Well, we didn't want Russians in the Middle East. And, but then Mr. Brezhnev added the point, and either, if, either you come in with me or I'll go in alone. And that was when we said, no, you're not going in alone. By October 14th, Egyptian fortunes have waned. Counterattacking Israeli troops pin Sadat's 8th Army against the canal. In an amazing reversal, Israeli commanders soon prepare to thrust into Cairo itself. But a victorious Israeli army marching into the ancient capital will push most Arab nations over the brink. War will surely engulf the Middle East and send the world economy into a tailspin. Uncertain of just where the opposing armies stand, American leaders have no way to gauge the threat 
or find a viable solution. Back in America, the SRs are given the green light. Secretly flown from California to Griffiths Air Force Base, New York, ground crews prepare their birds for the longest mission ever. Only personnel with the need to know are informed of the real purpose of the Blackbird's presence. While we were at Griffiths, it was a very interesting atmosphere because none of the people, the general public or even the average military guy on base, had any idea why we were there. The reason that was explained was that we were conducting training missions and trying out some new equipment. The only thing that made it unusual is that we were sleeping all during the day and staying up all night, so anybody that was watching would know that there was something unusual going on, but they probably would only have thought it was a night flight. So it was interesting from our perspective because we would see our friends, other Air Force people there that weren't connected with the program, and carry on normal conversations, and they would be asking us about how the equipment was working and those kinds of things, and yet we knew inside that we were basically preparing for these very important missions. So it was uh, just kind of an interesting dichotomy. Neither Arabs nor Israelis have been told of the impending overflights. The American planes have been denied the use of airstrips in England. The British are fearful of antagonizing the oil-rich Arabs, thus adding a transatlantic crossing to an already difficult job. The primary thing was that we were flying from the east coast of the United States over a lot of water uh, to get to the areas that we were conducting the reconnaissance tremendous pressure in terms of knowing that uh, if anything went wrong um, you could be in headlines tomorrow so the areas that we wanted to conduct the reconnaissance over there were a lot of politically sensitive borders that you wanted to avoid so flying those missions required a lot of concentration the navigation system provided you all the information you needed in order to be exactly where you wanted to be but there was a little extra concentration on our part in order to make the take good. Throughout the fall of 1973, unexplained sonic booms reverberate across the northeastern seaboard of the United States. Local newspapers report them as meteoric disturbances. Unknown to most, it is the sound of Blackbird pilots returning from the Middle East after a grueling 10-hour mission, a mission that includes 11 mid-air refuelings and five hours of Mach 3 flight. The Blackbirds bring with them an incredible bounty. Their cameras can survey an enormous area, 100,000 square miles in a single mission. Incredibly, the Americans decide to share these images with all of the parties involved, Egyptians, Israelis, and Syrians. Soon, hundreds of photographs are sent to leaders in Cairo, Tel Aviv, and Damascus. To my knowledge, this is the first time we've ever given photography, which is considered highly sensitive to both sides. You had people in the agency that were violently opposed to allowing the film from uh, cameras that were top secret to be obtained by a potential adversary, basically. Not only that, they were opposed to the uh, sharing, saying that if this material gets out, then people know the capabilities of our systems, then they can take countermeasures. That's always a danger. Uh, no one will speak of the capabilities of cameras because if they know that you can see objects, say, uh, two feet on the ground, then they're going to take camouflage, concealment, and deception methods. Peace in the Middle East was worth the revealing of our camera capabilities. By October 23rd, a ceasefire is in place. The pictures serve as evidence that neither side is engaging in a military buildup. It is hoped that they will ease tensions and maintain the peace. By 1974, a new commander-in-chief supervises Blackbird flights over the Sinai. 
CIA officials use a diorama in briefing President Gerald Ford on the situation. These are real big boards, and there was a complete map of the Sinai, and it would show the battle lines, it would show the, uh, where the uh, concentration of tanks were, it would show the results of airstrikes. Uh, it was a very comprehensive thing. All the information that we could possibly squeeze out of the SR-71 mission was squeezed out. Photo images taken by American spy planes help create a trust between Egyptian and Israeli that eventually leads to the Camp David Peace Accords of 1976. American aircraft maintain that trust to this very day. By United Nations resolution, overflights of the Sinai continue and the intelligence gathered is still shared. Ironically, the mission is now carried out by the Blackbird's predecessor, the U-2. Advances in satellite technology, budget cuts, and the end of the Cold War have led critics to claim that this spy plane's days are numbered. Evidence suggests that the next generation of hypersonic reconnaissance jets may not be that far off. That even now, men are streaking to the edge of space faster than ever before. Hundreds of seismic recorders buried in the desert around Los Angeles serve as an early warning system for earthquakes. Since 1991, the recorders have been rocked by unidentified sonic booms originating hundreds of miles off of the California coast. Scientists of the U.S. Geological Survey have discovered the unique and indelible mark that these sonic booms have left in their wake. If something is traveling very high over the area, the footprint of the sonic boom is, is also going to be very wide. That's one reason we think that whatever is causing this large sonic boom is, is traveling rel relatively high because the boom was felt all over the, the coastal area and we recorded it over quite a wide area here. One reason that uh, we're very good at identifying sonic booms is that we see the space shuttle land here several times a year. When it does land, we can track it across our instruments and estimate the height, the speed, and the direction very accurately. So when we saw other sonic booms, we tried to do the same kind of thing. The first one of these unusual sonic booms we saw was in June 91. And since then, we've seen about eight or ten very similar ones. And they caught our attention because they happened always at the same time of day on Thursday mornings, which was a little unusual. When you stare at these waveforms and, and these bumps and wiggles that we see in our record, the mystery one seems to be probably something smaller. Um, the frequency content is different, and it doesn't have that very characteristic N wave that we see very often for the shuttle or the SR-71. These people may have got a glimpse, some of them, of, of something being tested that, that maybe, maybe will be built someday, or maybe it was a loser, or maybe the funding didn't come through. Who knows? For example, it could have been a meteorite, but the fact that it's always coming on Thursday morning probably rules out that possibility. It's not the space shuttle, it's not the SR-71, because there were no scheduled flights, and also the signature looks very different. So after we rule that out, basically all we can say is something is flying faster than the speed of sound offshore the coast of Southern California. And the only thing I, I'm really aware of that's got some, uh, some substance to it is this remarkable photo, which has come to be known as the Donuts on a Rope exhaust contrail photograph, uh, which was taken by uh, a photographer named Steve Douglas in Amarillo, Texas. And it shows this unusual dotty exhaust contrail. Instead of looking like a, a line of chalk across a blue sky, it looks like boop, 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 boop. And now that's different. It was published in Aviation Week, and it ran in Popular Science, and it got, it, it got attention, like, what is this? And there were reports of unusual loud rumbling and stuff accompanying this thing. And, and it, it's, it's not a bad-looking photograph. It doesn't have that murky UFO look that you uh, 
come to mistrust. Unannounced and usually at night, the Pentagon's newest aircraft make their maiden voyages across the desert sky. Like the SR-71 and U-2, today's black projects are born at a remote desert testing facility in Nevada called Groom Dry Lake, or Area 51. The Pentagon denies that the facility exists. Ironically, pictures of it do, taken by Russian spy satellites and now for sale to the highest bidder. The desert tracts surrounding Groom Lake have become a mecca for aviation and UFO enthusiasts. Even the state of Nevada has recognized the site's unique commercial appeal. But occasionally, Air Force testing leaves real clues. Clues like unusual noises or strange contrails. Some engineers attribute this puffy contrail photographed over Texas to a pulse detonation wave engine, the next generation in aerial propulsion. It's a non-continuous type of combustion. A jet engine is a device that just, shh, it just runs all the time. You know, your car is going bang, 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 bang. A jet just runs continuously. Well, this pulsed combustion engine it, it is, is a design that goes boom, 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 boom. It doesn't run continuously. And presumably such an engine could make a contrail that, that looked puffy. To many, Uncovering proof of classified government programs is a game of cat and mouse. Skunk Works team member Ben Rich was Kelly Johnson's right-hand man for over 20 years. Rich was fascinated by the persistence of aviation enthusiasts in trying to prove that black projects exist. But he remained most enamored with the marvel that he and Kelly Johnson built over 35 years ago. In his biography, Rich said, had we built the Blackbird in the year 2010, the world would still have been awed by such an achievement. Just before his death, he refused to comment about future projects on the Skunk Works agenda. And when asked about the Donuts on a Rope photograph, he left only questions behind. And so I, I said, you know, Ben, uh, this, this, this is the one really th really intriguing thing that's sort of a piece of evidence and I said what am I supposed to make of this and he said well Stu for you and I to talk about that anymore you'd have to have a need to know like most cold warriors the blackbird faces an uncertain future more than once it has been retired only to be pulled back into service in a time of need those who flew the SR say that no satellite will ever match its flexibility. They say that without a high-speed reconnaissance aircraft, America will be left wanting. Enemy missiles could never catch it, but budget cuts eventually did. Meanwhile, those who know the true cause of the sonic booms now rattling the California coastline are keeping the secret to themselves. <laughs>